We are talking today with John Buchanan. He is author of the book Fixing America, Breaking the Stranglehold of Corporate Rule, Big Media, and the Religious Right. John, thanks for spending time with us today. Mike, thank you for having me. If you could begin, tell us uh, what was the motivation in writing your book Fixing America? Well, the book, uh, well, I've been a, an activist uh, my whole life. I was uh, an anti-Vietnam War activist from 1970 until the end of the war. I uh, was an anti-Richard uh, Nixon activist, a pro-impeach Richard Nixon activist uh, for two and a half years from the time of the Watergate break-in until uh, he resigned from office. And I was uh, an activist in uh, the 1980s in Los Angeles to uh, get Nelson Mandela out of prison. And so... I've always been an activist, and I've always seen in those three examples that activism worked and succeeded in reaching its goal. And I was never uh, traditionally political. I had only voted for president twice in my life, for Jimmy Carter in 76, and uh, I went out of my way to register to vote for Al Gore in Miami in 2000, only to have my vote stolen. And I uh, became political because uh, George Bush uh, was in office. All right. And what um, what were the circumstances that gelled where you decided that you needed to put these ideas that are in your book down on paper? What happened was that uh, as a result of uh, some of my work last fall, uh, most notably the now infamous Bush Nazi stories in the New Hampshire Gazette, uh, John McConnell, the uh, 89-year-old founder of Earth Day, who uh, lives in Denver now, uh, called me and uh, we had a one-hour uh, conversation uh, on October 13th last year, and uh, he asked me to run for president. He he said that he thought I had the kind of courage and conviction that I should run for president. What I didn't know in that conversation the first day was actually who he was, and that uh, his friends had included 33 Nobel Prize winners and uh, three secretaries general of the UN. So we spoke for an hour that first day, and uh, I told Mr. McConnell that I wasn't interested in running for office, but I would like to uh, write a platform with him for a, a, a really serious new third party that truly represented the interests of we the people over they the giant corporations. So uh, Mr. McConnell and I uh, began work on that. And uh, I just basically sat down with a legal pad and, and said to myself, you know, if, if I were to run for president or were to get elected president, what are the things that are wrong with the country that need to be fixed? And how would you fix them? And why is no major political candidate talking about those things. So I came up with, you know, the pretty obvious stuff that we're ruled by corporations, that lobbyists are the real instruments of subversion, that war profiteering is the career of choice uh, inside the beltway for Washington insiders and former government officials, that the corporate controlled mass media has failed to properly inform the American public. And probably most important, that we the people, if we really own this government, as Thomas Jefferson said we did, have failed miserably in our responsibilities of ownership. So that was the basic framework for it. Then uh, on November 13th, uh, a gentleman named Bob Furtick, who's the founder and CEO of the uh, large Democratic website, Democrats.com, uh, he had been posting... Uh, stuff about the Bush Nazi stories and follow-ups to the Bush Nazi story. And uh, he called me on November 13th, and he came up with the uh, wild idea that I uh, challenge Bush and run in the Republican New Hampshire primary. So I told him that uh, I had to sleep on that and that Mr. McConnell had already asked me and I had declined to run for anything, but I thought that was kind of an interesting idea to challenge him head on. And so uh, I said that I couldn't do that unless I could really do it with integrity, and I didn't know what a Republican was, so I would find out. So I went to Google, believe it or not, and I Googled conservative Republican values, and lo and behold, I found a smaller government, lower taxes, no military misadventures overseas, and strong protection of the Constitution. So I went, man, you know, not only am I a conservative Republican, but we all ought to be conservative Republicans, if that's what one really is. So I agreed to do it. Uh, I moved up to New Hampshire on January 2nd and uh, lived in New Hampshire for the month of January. And I ran against him as the truth candidate, a.k.a. the 911 truth candidate. And I ran as a journalist who tried to speak 
directly from factual material that I could support from research that I had done rather than rhetoric and political speeches that are just a lot of hot air. And what I uh, found in New Hampshire and since is that uh, the people of this country are desperate to hear the truth and that if you go out and just look them in the eye and tell them the truth, no matter what their question is, then there's not that much difference between Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives if you take away the volatile issues like abortion and gun control and same-sex marriage. So that was the uh, genesis of the book. I uh, tied for second place in the uh, New Hampshire primary on January 27th, and I beat 12 other Republicans, some of whom spent as much as a half a million dollars on their campaign, and I spent $3,000. And I got more Republican votes than uh, the Democrats, Dick Gephardt, Al Sharpton, and Carol Mosley Braun combined, which I thought was a pretty amazing thing. Dick Gephardt had served in the Congress for many, many years, and I got three times as many votes for president as he did, which was a very telling little factoid, I think. In your book, you've divided into sections, and um, the first part is talks about the rise of the corporate state. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, let me uh, make a point first about uh, how I open uh, all of my uh, talks on this uh, so-called national truth tour that uh, is designed to uh, impact the votes of Republicans and Christians on Election Day related to uh, some of the very specific and troubling things that are in the book that relate directly to the Bush administration. But when I go out every night, uh, the first thing I do is say I'd like to get a reading of the of the room, and so I want to ask you a, a couple of questions. Let me see uh, a show of hands of those of you who believe that the Fortune 500 own and operate this government and control every aspect of public policy. Uh, needless to say, 98 or 99 percent of the hands go up. And then I say, well, you know, let me see a show of hands of those of you who believe that Thomas Jefferson was telling the truth and that we the people own this government and that it's our responsibility to exercise public policy. And one or two hands go up. And last night in Sacramento and Monday night in Dover, New Hampshire, zero hands went up to the question of whether we the people own the government. So then the second question I ask is uh, how many how many of you think that truth and honor still matter in this culture and at that point there are snickers and laughs and you know wry noises and then I say how many of you think that truth and honor have been flushed down the toilet in this country in the era of popular culture and 98% of the hands go up so in in terms of what's in of that first section, the rise of the corporate state, I uh, give some historical perspective from people like uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and uh, former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who talked about the fact that we had to make a choice 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, that, that we had to make a clear choice between either great wealth being aggregated in the hands of a few or spread out widely among the population or we would ultimately have to make a choice between democracy and fascism. And uh, Justice Brandeis actually uh, had made that point most succinctly and, and said that point blank, that we would eventually have to make a choice between democracy and fascism if great wealth was accumulated in the hands of a few. And I don't think there's anyone uh, listening today who would disagree with the premise that virtually all wealth has accumulated in the hands of a few. And one of the more uh, shocking uh, facts that I discovered in, in researching the book was that basically one-third of one percent of the population control the great majority of the assets of this country. And the greatest marker of the uh, demographic of that particular one-third of one percent is that they earn personal incomes of a million dollars a year or more. The other uh, fact that I sort of knew but I didn't understand the extent of was the matrix of major shareholders of the Fortune 500 and how they all share ownership of one another and that the largest shareholders in Fortune 500 companies are typically other Fortune 500 companies. So the, the three things that I uh, trace it back to in the book, 
uh, are that uh, all of this really began to happen 30 years ago. The first thing that happened was the uh, wave of mergers and acquisitions that began in the late 1970s and really accelerated under Ronald Reagan, where companies started buying companies, started buying companies, and you ended up with the phenomenon of global. Well, originally they were called multinational. Now they're called transnational corporations that do global business everywhere on earth. The uh, second factor was the uh, consolidation of the media. About 30 years ago, there were approximately 600 uh, media companies that owned and operated television stations, radio stations, and newspapers. And although they were typically wealthy families, and among the wealthiest families in a particular city or town, they were civic-minded. They weren't perceived in most cases as being evil media barons and especially in the case of a television station license holders they really had a, a stake in the community now we see that only six companies essentially control the entire US media and that they in turn are owned by giant transnational corporations the classic example being NBC NBC is owned by General Electric General Electric has very significant business interests in nuclear power and and armaments and defense. So it would be a very naive news executive or reporter at an NBC television station who would risk their career on trying to break a story about the dangers of nuclear power or how war profiteering has become the career of choice in Washington. And so I build that case out just in a very succinct way to lay the groundwork for the second section of the book, which is called uh, the corporate lobbyist as instrument of subversion. And in that section, it, it starts off, the, the first chapter of that section, uh, starts off with what is probably one of the two or three most startling uh, facts that I learned in researching the book. And again, every night when I uh, go out to speak, I say, uh, somebody yell out a number if you think you're well-informed, but uh, tell me uh, how many full-time corporate lobbyists there are in Washington who call on the 535 members of Congress every day, and sometimes it's 500 and 1,000, and some nights somebody else 5,000, 10,000 one night. Well, the actual number is 25,000. There are 25,000 professional, full-time corporate lobbyists who represent major global U.S.-based, but not always, business interests and call on 535 members of Congress. That's 48 lobbyists for every member of the House and Senate, for anybody who doesn't want to do the math in their head real quick. And the even more startling uh, statistic is that in 2002, according to the watchdog group Political Money Line, they spent $1.6 billion, that's billion with a B, to have their way with members of Congress. And that, since it's illegal to directly uh, give members of Congress and state legislatures cash and bribe them directly, uh, there are two major avenues of influence. The obvious first one is that you cannot get elected to Congress anymore without being pre-approved by these most powerful lobbyists who then go out and raise money for your candidacy and do what's called bundling, where they can raise large increments of money without violating the individual uh, donation thresholds that exist under the Federal Election Commission. And then the other way they do it, which is probably well known, to your listeners is that they take members of Congress when they're getting ready to vote on key bills to Hawaii, Thailand, out for extravagant dinners and wine them and dine them and have Luciano Pavarotti sing for them or whatever they do. And, you know, I, I like to think that I'm a, a person of character and a strong-willed person, as I'm sure you do, and I just don't understand how it's humanly possible that anyone could resist that kind of onslaught. You know, everyone has a threshold of integrity beyond which you turn to jelly, I assume, and when, when that kind of money is being spent and that kind of relentless assault is being brought against you every day directly with the goal of affecting your votes in Congress, that's a, a perfect example of how we the people really don't have any chance in this government because even if you or I or your listeners want to get on a plane or get on a bus and go to Washington and take a day off from work to go lobby their congressional delegation for something that's really important to their community, 
unless you're taking a big bag of money with you, there is no way that you're going to have the same kind of impact that these full-time corporate lobbyists do inside the Beltway. The other uh, startling fact about them is that many, many of them uh, earn salaries of more than $1 million a year, so they're in that elite one-third of 1% 1 of the corporate ruling class. It's not uncommon for them to earn salaries of 5 to $10 million a year, and a number of them make more than $20 million a year lobbying Congress. I think that's a crime against everything this country stands for. And in my presidential platform and in uh, the solutions section of the book at the end, I call for a ban on professional lobbying, that, that only citizens should have the right to lobby and there should be no uh, price tag attached. Let's talk a bit about war profiteering and the military industrial complex. If we look at today's examples, things like uh, Halliburton in Iraq seems really uh, to be a, a good example of where that's gotten out of control. But I've been doing some extra reading lately on the history of war profiteering, and I'm surprised, or, and I shouldn't be, surprised to find out that in a lot of ways that's nothing new. That's been going on since, you know, since the Civil War. Oh, abs absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, things that I learned in uh, reporting the Bush Nazi stories is that uh, the Bush family have been war profiteers for a hundred years, going back to before World War I. And Samuel Bush, who was the father of Prescott Bush, he was uh, this president's great-grandfather on uh, his father's side, um, was a, a notorious war profiteer in World War I. Uh, he worked in concert with Remington Arms, which was owned by the DuPont family. And one of uh, Samuel Bush's associates uh, in World War I was named Samuel Pryor. And Samuel Pryor was immortalized as uh, one of the minor players in the famous book, The Merchants of Death, that chronicled the war profiteers in World War I. And then since World War I, uh, I now know from my reporting in the New Hampshire Gazette and since that uh, not only did they uh, back the Bolsheviks in the Russian Revolution, but they also backed Mussolini, Hitler, and Stalin. And, you know, literally 15 or 20 million people died innocently in the Holocaust and in the purges in Stalinist Russia, while Prescott Bush and W. Averill Harriman and his younger brother Roland Harriman and George Herbert Walker, the maternal great-grandfather of George W. Bush, shamelessly war profiteered and then covered that activity up for 70 years. And it still has not come out in the mainstream press to the extent that it should, so the American people can understand just how criminal the Bush family has been and is under this president. But you're absolutely right about the long history of it. Uh, specifically, well, actually, actually the, uh, one of my uh, newfound heroes is uh, a, a former uh, Marine general that I'm sure many of your listeners are uh, knowledgeable about, General Smedley Butler, the two-time Congressional Medal of Honor winner, who is one of the top five American military heroes in all of our history, probably. Uh, he served for 33 years and four months in the Marine Corps, uh, won the Congressional Medal of Honor twice, and when he made his retirement speech in 1931, uh, he made the famous comment uh, that war is just a racket. And he said that a racket is best described, I believe, as something that's not what it appears to be. And its true nature is only known to a few insiders who perpetrate it. And, and I think that's a perfect characterization of the run-up to the war in Iraq and what we see happening in Iraq now. It certainly is not the export of freedom and democracy, and it certainly is not any attempt to stand for the values that the United States of America represent. It is, in fact, a military-industrial complex racket for profiteering based on greed rather than patriotism. Uh, the great uh, English writer Samuel Johnson uh, once uh, said very famously that patriotism is the last resort of scoundrels. And I think that that's a very telling observation of George W. Bush and why I hope and pray that uh, whether he's reelected or not on November 2nd, that he and his family will someday be held accountable for their long history of war profiteering and brutality and 
brought to justice, as the president likes to say, of, of al-Qaeda and the terrorists. Uh, what you see in Washington now, well, Daddy Bush is, is a, another uh, good example, and I'm sure uh, many of your listeners, because you have a well-informed audience, know this as well, but the uh, famous Washington uh, private equity fund, the Carlyle Group, a $13 billion a year private enterprise that's in the war profiteering business. The major players besides Daddy Bush have been James A. Baker III, the crony, the Bush family crony who went down to Florida in 2000 and engineered the theft of a presidential election and did business with the bin Laden family from the 1970s onward uh, is a classic example of what goes on. You have this gigantic monolithic company that's known uh, as the ex-president's club. They do business with Saudi Arabia and other notoriously evil regimes around the world. And because they are a privately held company, the media and the citizenry have no true access to what their business is, how they influence Washington, and so on, except you get books like uh, House of Bush, House of Saud by Craig Unger, which you know, does some pretty serious reporting on how evil the Carlyle Group is, but even he isn't able to sit with public records like you can go through for a publicly traded company and really understand the numbers and the deals and the relationships and, and all of that. Then you get the uh, big three uh, players in terms of defense contracts now are Lockheed, uh, Raytheon, and Boeing. And uh, Raytheon was the big winner uh, immediately after 911. When the when the uh, stock market reopened uh, after its closure as a result of 911, the, the the single biggest winner was Raytheon. Their stock went through the roof because of the uh, anticipation of a lot of the uh, homeland security business that they would get. And these companies have profited shamelessly from both the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, as well as the. Uh, attacks of 911. Interestingly enough, Smedley Butler proposed back in 1931 that uh, there should uh, not be profits made from war, that companies that are successful, that are making money, that have the kinds of uh, resources and capabilities that need to be used in a time of national defense should do the patriotic thing and deliver that those products at cost and not make a profit. And, and publicly waive any notion of profiting from the tragedy of war. Uh, now you see the opposite, where they gleefully profit, and it's a feeding frenzy every time there's a military uh, encounter by this country. And George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, by their own admission, frequently, uh, including during the, the debates, uh, speak of the concept of endless war, that we will be at war for generations to come as we hunt down these terrorist organizations around the country. And it just astonishes me that the American people are stupid enough to buy into that fantasy and not see it for what it is. It's interesting. I saw in the uh, movie, the documentary, The Corporation, I don't know if you've seen that, but they uh, mention in there, and I had heard this long ago and forgotten it, that Smedley Butler was actually hired by corporations to do a coup in D.C., Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that uh, is uh, two chapters in the book. One chapter is uh, about, it, it's in, a, it's in a, a section called, Are We Living in a Neo-Fascist State? And uh, the first chapter in that section uh, uses an essay by a, a noted scholar named Lawrence W. w. Britt, to, uh, who studied all the modern fascist states of the 20th century, uh, the most obvious being Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany, but also Franco's Spain and Papadopoulos's Greece and Pinochet's Chile and a number of others, and identified 14 uh, characteristic points of what all of these uh, modern fascist states had in common. So after that chapter, I have a section that starts off, I mean, a, ch a chapter that starts off by saying, for those of you who uh, don't think it's possible that a fascist uh, dictatorship could be brought to the United States, you need to understand that a serious attempt was made to do that in 1934, and that along with the story of the uh, Nazi past of the Bush family, uh, this is another 
completely missing a chapter of American history. It doesn't exist in history books, elementary school books, scholarly texts, nowhere. It's been completely expunged from the public record. So I found out about a f book called uh, The Plot to Seize the White House, written in 1972 by a noted historian and biographer named Jules Archer. And incredibly, this book came out in 1972, uh, details the whole plot and how they did hire Smedley Butler. The plan uh, included uh, Remington Arms and the DuPont family. Uh, Remington Arms was going to provide the arms. Uh, the plot was basically led by J.P. Morgan and a few other uh, elite families, including uh, Prescott Bush through a uh, shadowy organization uh, called the American Liberty League. The American Liberty League was to liberty back then what the Patriot Act is to patriotism now. It's an Orwellian use of language that has nothing to do with the real underlying intent of what the activity was. They uh, originally wanted uh, General Doug Douglas MacArthur to lead the coup. The plan was to recruit a 500,000-man army of disgruntled uh, World War I veterans. The only mistake they made and the only reason we're not living in a fascist state right now under a dictator is that they hired the wrong guy. They hired Smedley Butler because he was a hero to World War I veterans. Uh, he, that, that began uh, on July 1st of 1933 and uh, went on until November of 1934, and Smedley Butler played along until he understood exactly what was going on and who the lead plotters were, and then uh, he went uh, to uh, the Philadelphia News newspaper. The editor of the Philadelphia News uh, was a friend of his, and uh, he in turn assigned uh, a very famous reporter of his day. His name was Paul Comley French. And this is a very uh, relevant point to the uh, political climate that we live in today and the arrogance of Bush and Cheney in terms of, you know, telling us on the record what they're going to do and what's going to happen, as in there will be another terrorist attack. It may happen before the election. We may have to cancel or postpone the election. And so uh, Paul Comley French back then went and sought out the lead plotters on the record uh, they knew that he was a newspaper reporter, and they talked to him on the record about the need to overthrow the U.S. government and abolish the presidency. So their plan, now these are all families that had, and companies that had just backed Adolf Hitler. Uh, Adolf Hitler had just come to power, and what their plan was to uh, assassinate FDR, abolish the office of the presidency, and replace the office of president with a civil dictator who would serve for as long as they wanted him to be in power. Uh, when I went back to, uh, when, when I read the uh, plot to seize the White House, I bought uh, back in the spring uh, what is believed to be the last known copy in print. I paid $650 for it to a rare book dealer in Boston who said that as far as he knows, this was the last known copy of it, and I wouldn't have included it uh, in my book if I didn't have a copy of The Plot to Seize the White House because it's such an outrageous sounding claim to say that they tried to overthrow the U.S. government. But even after I read the book and did some additional research and, and reported on it in these uh, two chapters in Fixing America, I there was still a part of me that just couldn't grasp the fact that it could actually be real. So when I went back to the uh, National Archives and the Library of Congress uh, in uh, early August uh, with the Guardian newspaper, which ran a uh, Bush Nazi story uh, several weeks ago, uh, I, uh, when the Guardian reporter went into Washington to uh, have lunch with a colleague, I figured I was at the Library of Congress and had some free time, so I would go upstairs and uh, try to find the microfilm uh, transcripts of the actual hearings of the McCormick-Dickstein Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives in November of 1934 as a result of Smedley Butler uh, blowing the whistle. Those hearings began with secret testimony uh, in New York from Smedley Butler and Paul Comley French, and then as a result of that secret testimony, uh, they reconvened about a week later uh, on Capitol Hill, and there were public hearings. In those hearings, uh, it was established, among other things, that they thought Hitler was doing the right thing. 
that Hitler understood that because our, and this is another very relevant thing to bear in mind about the state of affairs that we're in today, that because the country was under attack and there were outside agitators who wanted to destroy America and destroy everything America stands for, precisely the same rhetoric you get today from Bush and Cheney, that it was an acceptable thing to install a Hitler-type dictatorship. They talked about the fact that because there were so many disgruntled unemployed people from the Depression and so many disgruntled troops from World War I who had not been given their bonuses for having served in combat, that uh, it was okay to build uh, concentration camps and round up the loud-mouthed unemployed and World War I veterans and put them in concentration camps at forced labor. That is a matter of public record. And so I would point out to your listeners that these are public documents that are readily available at the Library of Congress, and anybody with high school level research skills can go there and look at these transcripts and see for themselves the kind of power structure that we're talking about in this country and have always been talking about, and the threat that we face today from George W. Bush and the Bush family militarist cronies. Do you know with the part of the uh, testimony that was secret that was held in New York, do they still have actual records of that which one day might be uh, turned over to the public or are there no records of that? There's records of everything. As a matter of fact, I went back uh, with a reporter I probably uh, shouldn't name, but uh, he's a fairly uh, well-known uh, national reporter. And uh, he showed up on my doorstep in Kennebunkport, Maine, uh, several weeks ago and had been told about my whole saga with my Secret Service detention and arrest in Miami and all the stuff that we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, he wanted to uh, have me come to Washington and show him the document. So I had, as I mentioned, uh, seen the uh, McCormick Dickstein uh, Smedley Butler transcripts back in early August, so I knew exactly where they were and you know how to easily go back and see them. So uh, when this reporter and I went, and then by the way, he writes uh, sometimes for the New York Times and Washington Post and Los Angeles Times. So he's a you know he's not a household word, but he's a very significant national reporter for major national newspapers and magazines. And so uh, when we went back. Uh, just as I did when I stumbled onto the Bush Nazi documents, I got very lucky and I found out that there had been earlier hearings in uh, the spring and in June of 1934 of the McCormick Dickstein Committee uh, under the same uh, theme, which was uh, investigation of Nazi activities and propaganda in the U.S. The uh, first uh, Bush, uh, harem, and Nazi front business that was seized under the Trading with the Enemy Act in uh, 1940, in August of 1942, was a German shipping line known as Hamburg America Line. Uh, there had always been these rumors uh, that I had seen, but I had never seen uh, confirmation of that among the many things Hamburg America Line did was uh, bring Nazi spies into the U.S. and operate uh, violent brown shirt organizations inside the U.S., uh, offer free passage to Germany in the late 1920s and early 30s for American citizens who would be willing to go to Germany and proselytize for Hitler etc. And I stumbled on to uh, three weeks ago in uh, early uh, September or mid-September uh, hundreds of pages of documents from the summer of 1934 that was the McCormick Dickstein's Committee investigation of Hamburg America Line. They interviewed the alien Nazi spies that were brought in on Hamburg America Line ships they uh, interviewed the publisher of a Nazi newspaper in the U.S. that Hamburg America Line surreptitiously supported with what appeared to be advertising revenues. The only problem was that they were paying a huge multiple for their ads of what other advertisers paid, and it was uncovered that uh, there was, that was a secret mechanism for being able to fund this Nazi newspaper. There were Nazis identified by name who testified before the McCormick Dickstein Committee, and when asked if they were members of the Nazi Party, said yes. And they, in turn, 
uh, talked about an organization called the Friends of the New Germany that the Harrimans and George Herbert Walker and Prescott Bush vigorously supported. So the, the point of that information is that they directly participated in Nazi subversion of the United States of America, most notably by consciously participating in smuggling Nazi spies into the U.S., and to this day, that is not public information. To answer your question, uh, after my struggle for a year uh, to try to really get this story out to the mainstream media, uh, I elected to give all of these documents to this reporter, and uh, he is trying very hard to get that story broken uh, before the election or uh, as soon as possible after the election. But incredibly, he has run into the same resistance I ran into, despite the fact that his credentials are much greater than mine. And the classic argument that he's gotten so far that I got is that you can't hold the sins of the grandfather against the son. Well, the uh, first article that I wrote in the New Hampshire Gazette uh, didn't suggest in any way that the sins of the grandfather ought to be held against the son. And the, the lead paragraph of the first story was uh, after 60 years of inattention and even denial by the U.S. media, newly uncovered documents at the National Archives demonstrate that. And so the reason that I make that point is that to me what the story was about was the 70-year cover-up and the fact that in none of the Bush family uh, political campaigns going back to 1948 when Prescott Bush ran unsuccessfully, I'm sorry, in 1950, when uh, Prescott Bush ran unsuccessfully for the Senate and then was elected uh, as a Republican from Connecticut two years later in 1952. None of this surfaced in his campaign. None of this surfaced in any of George Herbert Walker Bush's campaigns, not during his presidency, and none of this has surfaced during George W. Bush's uh, governorship of Texas or campaign for president. When I argued with the national editors of the New York Times, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times a year ago, most notably uh, Tom uh, Furlong, who's the deputy national editor of the Los Angeles Times, we had three hour-long conversations about the documents and what they meant. And I had hope uh, that the, the LA Times would actually report the story which would have broken it all over the world, needless to say. And in the third conversation, uh, he said to me, in, in good faith, I, I don't think he was being as criminal as Bill Keller from the New York Times, who I hold in, in utter and complete contempt, which is also a, a significant part of my book, how the New York Times has misreported a lot of important stories or failed to report, in, including the 1934 uh, coup attempt. But when I talked to Mr. Furlong the third time, he said, I just, I just don't see the news value here. You're looking at a bunch of old documents never been commented on publicly. They're not part of, you know, the, the historical text of the country. It's, it's old history. And I was just not able to convince him of the relevance. What I think the relevance has been and is, well, when I uh, first sent the documents to uh, Stephen Fowle, the editor and publisher of the New Hampshire Gazette, which is the oldest newspaper in the country, and uh, which gave Samuel Adams his first byline in 1756, when I first sent the documents to uh, Stephen Fowle, uh, I made a very important point, I thought, and I said, Mr. Fowle, the thing that you uh, need to understand right off the bat is what my motives are for taking this story public. If George W. Bush were being hailed on the editorial pages of every major newspaper in this country as the most compassionate Republican president in American history, and if there were being op-ed pieces written every week that he is the most socially progressive and humanistic president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt, then I would have forgotten what I saw at the National Archives and I would have let sleeping dogs lie. But in light of the fact that he's just invaded a country and toppled its government based on false pretense and propaganda, just as Hitler did in Poland in 1939, and considering that they're rounding up people of a particular type, which are Muslims, and putting them in to concentration camps in Guantanamo Bay, and since they're subverting the Constitution and traditional constitutional rights as they've been known in this country for 200 years under the Patriot Act, 
I submit that these documents are very relevant because what we're witnessing is a repeat of what Hitler did in his rise to power in Nazi Germany in 1932, 1933, 1934. I believe today that's truer than ever. I, I defy anyone to look me in the eye and give me a reasoned explanation of their belief that you cannot compare the Bush administration to the Hitler regime in terms of what they have specifically done to subvert their governments, bring their populations under their thumb, and wreak havoc on the world. And if George W. Bush is reelected on November 2nd, I shudder to think what will happen to this country, and that's why I'm out on the road trying to do my little part by bringing these truths out to people across the country that uh, he is unfit for re-election and not only should be voted out of office, but should be held accountable for his crimes against this country, which I consider to be treason. John, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Kevin Phillips' book, American Dynasty. When I had him here on the show, he, and um, uh, paraphrasing here, he had said in his research, which he had felt he had done more research than anything that had been done up to that time on the whole connection between the, the Bush family and the Nazis, he said there just wasn't a smoking gun there to really um, show that Prescott Bush and uh, the Bush family back then knowingly were supporting the Nazis have you found stuff that would contradict that? Yes, absolutely. And I would be interested in uh, hearing the reaction of Mr. Phillips' uh, reaction to what I'm about to report. But um, my mother raised me never to quit in a, in a righteous battle. And so I, despite everything that I've been through, I never... Uh, gave up the belief that this the smoking gun would in fact materialize and that uh, sooner or later the full story would be told and I, I cling to that belief uh, when I mentioned earlier uh, that I went back to the gar uh, back to the uh, National Archives and Library of Congress with the uh, reporter from The Guardian uh, last April uh, I had met, uh, she had found me on the internet, uh, a, a German uh, author and a journalist named Eva Schweitzer, who uh, lives in Berlin, but also uh, has an apartment in New York. So she goes back and forth, and she's written uh, six books in uh, Germany. Uh, she uh, has a very explosive book that just came out uh, on October 6th, uh, titled The USA and the Holocaust. Uh, beginning last spring, uh, I helped her uh, find all of the uh, documents that I had found at the National Archives and Library of Congress. Uh, among those documents are documents that show that Prescott Bush was a shareholder in the most infamous of the Nazi front businesses, which was known as Union Banking Corporation, known as UBC, which was a money laundering uh, operation. Uh, what, in what caused the investigations by the U.S. government that led to the uh, five seizures of the five major businesses in the uh, fall of 1942 uh, was a story in the New York Herald Tribune uh, on Ju uh, July 30th of uh, 1942. The uh, headline was Hitler's Angel has $3 million in U.S. Bank. The person that the story referred to uh, was the Nazi industrialist Fritz Thiessen. His name is spelled T-H-Y-S-S-E-N. Uh, he was the wealthiest man in Germany. Uh, he controlled the uh, steel and coal industries in Germany and therefore uh, largely built, along with his partner, uh, who was also a steel and coal baron named Friedrich Flick, uh, the two of them built the Nazi war machine. There have been studies done and information published about the uh, direct proportion of the Nazi war machine in terms of pig iron and steel and coal and all of the resources that were used to arm uh, Hitler and build Nazi Germany. And that's a matter of public record. 
I have the documents that show that Prescott Bush and the Harrimans were shareholders in Union Banking Corporation. Uh, Prescott Bush, in his own diaries, uh, which Eva Schweitzer found at Columbia University and reports on in her book, uh, in his own handwriting, Prescott Bush talks about how he ran the day-to-day -day operations of Union Banking Corporation and the other Thiessen uh, controlled businesses. Uh, Prescott Bush and the Harrimans were also partners in the Wall Street uh, private banking and investment firm Brown Brothers Harriman, which exists to this day. So uh, I hope uh, one way or another Mr. Phillips will get to hear this interview and ponder what I'm about to inform him of in addition to that. But when I went back to the archives uh, with the uh, Guardian reporter, uh, once again I got lucky and there were uh, about uh, t two dozen boxes of documents that uh, came from the uh, FBI investigation, massive uh, FBI investigation of uh, IG Farben, the giant industrial cartel that made the poison gases for the death camps and operated and managed the, the death camp at Auschwitz. And I was just going through, you know, files. They, th those documents had been declassified in uh, September of 2003, so they were very recently declassified. And uh, lo and behold, I found documents that link them directly to IG Farben and to the death camp at Auschwitz. Uh, Polish Newsweek, uh, known as Newsweek Polska, had uh, reported that story in uh, very early 2003, a uh, short news item in the Periscope section of the magazine, uh, just like we get here in the States, under the headline, A Bush uh, Family Profited from Slave Labor at Auschwitz. Uh, incredibly, uh, U.S. Newsweek spiked that story and never ran it. Uh, I spoke myself, which is in my first New Hampshire Gazette article, to uh, Michael Isakoff, the Newsweek reporter who became rich and famous reporting about the sperm stain on Monica Lewinsky's dress. So he built a career out of reporting on Bill Clinton's sex life, but he would not report on the Nazi past uh, of the Bush family, and I publicly uh, reported on that in my first New Hampshire Gazette article. Uh, Eva Schweitzer and I were uh, back at the archives three weeks ago when uh, this reporter that I mentioned was there uh, with us. And since then, uh, between the two of us, she has found documents showing that they moved uh, Nazi assets uh, into Chile uh, toward the end of the war and after the war. Uh, I have in my possession that they did uh, business with uh, named Nazis uh, in uh, Switzerland, Brazil, Argentina, and Panama after the war. And Fritz Thiessen died in Argentina in 1951, and that was when the assets of Union Banking Corporation were liquidated, and uh, Prescott Bush and George Herbert Walker received $1.5 million for their shares in Union Banking Corporation. So I really uh, fail to understand how Kevin Phillips uh, could get it so wrong and not be able to do what a low-level freelance reporter from Miami, namely myself, was able to go do. I have nowhere near his journalistic credentials or authorial credentials, but I have documents that he ought to see, and maybe that will clarify the, the facts for him. So what was it that, and maybe you already mentioned this, what was it that got you, that inspired you to write the original article in the New Hampshire Gazette? Well, what, what originally happened, actually, and this, except for the fact I was abducted by the Secret Service and then arrested in Miami, this, this to me is probably the most amazing part of the whole story. Uh, I, I lived in Los Angeles for 14 years, and I had a very good uh, life in Los Angeles. I owned an advertising agency and PR firm for a while. I was a travel writer, did, did, was in the music business. I did a lot of uh, fun stuff when I lived in L.A. And so uh, I had had a very good year in 2002, and I had been an a international luxury travel writer for National Magazine. So I went to Paris twice. I went to Africa with Sir Richard Branson. I went to, I went to uh, 19 countries in uh, 2002 as a travel writer. And uh, I don't like to 
uh, repeat myself, and I'd like to always look for something new and different to do. So after having such a great year in 2002 and ending up uh, going to Africa to Richard Branson's uh, game resort in uh, late November, uh, I got it in my head that I wanted to do something just completely different. So I decided that what I really wanted to do was move back to L.A. and become a movie screenwriter. And so I figured that at my advanced age and, you know, knowing how brutally competitive the, the, the script writing market was, that I would have to really come up with a whopper of a movie script. So I uh, found at uh, the website TakeBackTheMedia.com uh, a flash movie uh, titled Bush is Not a Nazi, So Stop Saying So. And it was this really cool flash movie that talked about how they profited from slave labor at Auschwitz and whatever. And, and frankly, I didn't really believe it. I just thought that it was so over the top that it could trigger, you know, an interesting plot for a movie script. So I approached this movie script as a journalist and investigative reporter and I wrote a movie script where everybody in the movie is real except me and I just change my name from John Buchanan to John Brady. I keep the same initials. I just change my name and the editor of the newspaper I supposedly work for in Washington is you know made up Washington Weekly whatever. But otherwise uh, George W. Bush is real, Rumsfeld is real, Cheney is real, Daddy Bush, James A. Baker, the Carlisle Group. The, uh, the actual CEO of the Carlisle Group at the time, whose name was Frank Carlucci. And so I came up with a plot. And the plot of the movie, which strangely enough, by the way, takes place uh, right now. It, it, it was structured to take place culminating right before the election with the destruction of the entire administration by the revelation in the mass media of the Nazi past of the family. But what the script was about it's called Project Clear Vision, and Project Clear Vision was a, a super secret uh, anthrax development program that the CIA ran illegally beginning under Reagan uh, at Fort Detrick, Maryland. And for those of your listeners who don't know, uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland is supposedly the location where the Ames strain of anthrax that was used in the anthrax letters after 911 was engineered. So I cooked up this plot that the Nazi that the German principles of Bayer AG, the Bayer Aspirin Company, which uh, was one of the three companies that grew out of IG Farben after the war, that they had these documents in their vault all these years. And that uh, I found out from Bayer's own annual report from 2001, I mean from 2000, that they were in a serious financial difficulty and that they needed to have gigantic increases in pharmaceutical sales in the U.S. in 2002. And lo and behold, Bayer makes Cipro, which went through the roof after the uh, anthrax letters. So I cooked up this plot that the Nazi principles of Bayer blackmailed Daddy Bush through the Carlisle Group into, a, into getting George W. Bush to allow the anthrax letters to be mailed as a way to save Bayer and sell Cipro and so on and so forth. And this reporter, which is supposed to be me, gets this story and, you know, goes through death threats and intimidation and all kinds of stuff to break the story that brings down the Bush administration right before the 2004 election. And the last 10 minutes of the movie is all of them resigning all the way down to Condoleezza Rice. And there's this media feeding frenzy in the last 10 minutes of, you know, network broadcasters trying to news broadcasters trying to get on the air that, you know, now. Cheney's resigning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I finished. I wrote the script in uh, about a month, and working furiously on it. And uh, I uh, called, or uh, I researched and found that a, a really good agent in Los Angeles was uh, this kid named Brad Rosenfeld at an agency called Preferred Artist. So uh, August the 29th of 2003, uh, I got him on the phone, which was the uh, Thursday before the Labor Day weekend. Uh, he said, that sounds like an interesting script to me. You know, send it to me, and I'll take a read of it over the holiday weekend. So I FedExed it to him that day. Uh, he got it on Friday, and he told me he would call me first thing Tuesday morning, the day after Labor Day. So I, you know, paced all weekend, got really neurotic. You know, I wonder if I'm going to have a career in screenwriting. And uh, lo and behold, at noon on Tuesday, which was 9 a.m. in Los Angeles and noon in Miami, the phone rings, 
And he says, John, Brad Rosenfeld, how are you? And I go, great, Brad. I've been pacing all weekend. You know, what, what's up with the script? Did you like it? And he says, well, I, I have bad, I have good news and bad news. So I said, well, give me the good news first. And he said, you have indeed written a mother of a movie script, and this could sell for a lot of money and really establish you as a screenwriter in L.A. It's a great script. And so I'm jumping up and down in my apartment and, you know, high-fiving myself, and I calm down and say, Brad, what could possibly be the bad news? And he says, nobody's going to touch this script because it's so explosive unless you can actually go find the proof that they have this Nazi past. So my, my bubble was immediately burst, and I said, you know, Brad, you know, first of all, you know, I found it on the Internet. I don't even know if it's true, but if it were true, I have no idea how I would go about finding it. But, hey, man, if it's a matter of selling a movie script, I'll figure out a way to go do it. And once again, I just got very lucky. That was on September 2nd. And two weeks later, I went to the National Archives and found the documents. Now, the really depressing news is that even after publishing the stories in the New Hampshire Gazette, it turned out nobody in Hollywood would touch the script because they were terrified of the backlash that would come down on them from the Bush regime and the Bush family because look at what they did to Michael Moore, for example, with Fahrenheit 911. And if that's what happened to Michael Moore with a mere documentary that has a, you know, a lot of humor in it, uh, I, I shudder to think what would have happened to me if this movie had gotten made. The plan was to get the movie made and have it come out this summer, you know, just, just before the election as a way of, of ending his presidency. And needless to say, the movie has never been made and the script will be a collector's item by the time the election is over. But that was the genesis of the whole thing. And when I, when I went to the archives uh, the first day, uh, September 17th of 2003. To be honest, when I got out of the uh, taxi cab to walk into the archives, I, I consciously had this thought that these documents just couldn't exist. As, as much as I hate the Bush family, this is just too over the top. And I, I have a lot of integrity, and so the thought uh, also crossed my mind that if the documents, in fact, did not exist, that I would have a moral responsibility to report that story and say there are these vicious Nazi rumors on the Internet, and the fact is that these documents do not exist at the National Archives, etc., but within one eight-hour day, I copied 200-odd pages that proved everything that was on the Internet about the seizures in 1942, and the rest is just bad theater and history now at this point.